I'm Sandra Sasseroli. I'm here in um, White Plains with John Clarkin, uh, and I have some questions for him that I will um, give to him now. The first question. John, tell me the importance of the theory of drive in your therapy. I don't think you will find uh, the concept of drive in our manuals. So that concept um, is not in those manuals. Uh, what's really uh, more salient in object relations theory is how um, the internalized object relations are the centerpiece for the organization of human behavior. And the best representation of drive from that point of view is affect. So the emotional affective system and how it infuses the internal representations of self and other and propels or drives the individual to act in certain ways. So for you, the, uh, when you speak with, of affects, it's very near to attachment theory too. No, I'm talking about emotion, affect as in emotion. Uh, but they learn it in an attachment uh, situation. Oh, of course, absolutely. So for you sure. this is for granted. Well, first of all, I think that emotion is grounded in the neurobiological system. And then secondly, the expression of those affects in behavior is modified over time in the home with, with uh, relationships with significant other people. Oh, okay. okay. As you know, we are cognitive therapists. Uh, even if, as you know, uh, cognitive therapy is not what it was uh, with Aaron Beck 50 years ago. There is the third wave, and so we are working with difficult clients. Um, but we are here to sp in this week to stay with you. and. This is the question. What can a, te a cognitive therapist learn from your therapy on transfer? Well, first of all, I think that the cognitive therapists in this country, uh, for example, Robert Leahy, are beginning to think in greater detail, I believe, about the relationship between the patient and the therapist, not just in terms of a good therapeutic alliance, but rather in terms of Leahy, actually a cognitive therapist, a president of the yes, uh, International, I think, mm -hmm. uh, uses the word resistance. Mm -hmm. So he talks about resistance uh, in the relationship between patient and therapist. So I think that um, there are many aspects of the focus by TFP on the relationship between patient and therapist that might be useful to cognitive behavioral therapists. But when, uh, when you in speak, Larry speaks of resistance, uh -huh. what it has to do with defenses? I would have, I, I don't know, I'd have to go back and look at how Leahy uses the term. Um, but obviously in, in psychodynamic terms it relates to defenses, of course. But not just defenses, it relates to the internalized representations of how one relates to other people. And we think that those paradigms, those schemas, if you will, uh, get acted out in the treatment. And somebody like Marshall Linehan often talks about um, therapy interfering behaviors by the therapist, um, by the patient. Sí. <laughs> and um, we think those are not just therapy interfering things that must be ignored or gone around. Or thrown away. Or thrown away, but rather they're data. They are actually data that the, the therapist can use to understand how the patient gets into difficulties in other relationships in their life. Okay, this is what it was clear today in the supervision. And then I have another question. Uh, uh,
can you tell us uh, uh, the role of the mentalization concept in uh, your in your TFP therapy? Well, I could relate to that from a research point of view yes. and from a clinical point of view. Um, from a research point of view, uh, we have used the adult attachment interview before and after a year of TFP and DBT and a supportive treatment. Mm. And we have scored those for reflective functioning. Mm. We think that if our treatment works like we think it does, reflective functioning should go up in patients treated with TFP. And in fact, we found that it does. Okay. That RF goes up significantly in patients in TFP, but does not go up in DBT, nor in a supportive treatment. So we think that um, using, and then clinically, we think the use of clarification, that is to help the patient mentalize, if you will, or to push their ability to conceptualize and mentalize as far as possible, and then using confrontation to examine uh, contradictions in their articulations, and then to go on to some kind of interpretive work, we think that that increases mentalization. Mm -hmm. So it's a way, it's a not direct way to have the same goal that has, for example, Fonagy. Um, it's not clear to me that Fonaki's treatment increases RF. I, I haven't seen any data on that. Okay. Our treatment does increase RF, we think, because we go beyond just clarification. It seems to us that mentalization, I mean, uh, Fonaki's treatment is mainly concerned with clarifications. Okay. Um, and, and is very cautious about interpretation. We are less cautious about that. See, I saw, we saw this. <laughs> and what is your opinion about the relationship between drives and executive functions? I think I would rephrase that, given See. what I said about drives See. earlier. For us, uh, it's a relationship uh, between uh, affect, emotions, and affect regulation. So how do people both experience their emotions, both in terms of when they experience them and the intensity of those, and how are those modified by what, what um, neurobiologists have called effortful control? The ability of the prefrontal system to modulate and control affect. So, uh, th this is quite central, I think, to borderline pathology. The uh, intensity of affect response by borderline patients and the lack of effort for control, their inability to modulate intense affect in the here and now. Mm. And um, what, what Marsha Linehan does is that she goes directly to the emotion, this regulation. What you do is different. You work on it in the transfer relationship. She goes directly toward it how? Uh, in, uh, toward the uh, emotional dysregulation. You mean by, uh, by mindfulness? Uh, by mindfulness and by education. Uh -huh. uh, yes. Well, I would introduce here the notion of cool situations and hot situations. Okay, tell us. I think that um, it's one thing to uh, sit and talk about some relationship out there in an abstract way and how to manage one's affect in that relationship. I think it's another thing in the hot situation. Mm -hmm. So once the affect is uh, uh, um, uh, stimulated, how does the person regulate that affect 
in the heat of the moment. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, Linehan's approach tends to be along the cool dimension, to talk about and articulate what might do, what, you, how, what skills you could use in those situations. I think that's helpful. But I think that in addition, uh, when it really comes down to it, it's the ability of the patient in the here and now and the heat of an intense relationship to modulate affect. And that's the focus of TFP, especially those interactions between patient and therapist mm. in the room. See, uh, yesterday we saw some uh, session that... Uh, and if you, uh, if, you, if you should give me uh, what part of this intervention is of uh, a cognitive style and what part is of uh, emotional uh, area, what would you say? Um, Difficult question. I, I don't, I, I think that um, the brain uh, doesn't have cognitions without affect or affect okay. without cognitions. I think there's always a blend of the two. So I, I, think, I think that uh, we're constantly uh, dealing with the patient in both cognitive and affective units. A major theory of personality, which is not psychodynamic, mm -hmm. is that of Michelle and Shoda, at least mm -hmm. in the United States. The heart of the theory is what he calls cognitive affective units. Mm -hmm. If you read this theory, and it's not psychodynamic, mm -hmm. it's very close to what psychodynamic theory calls um, internalized dominant object relationships. Mm -hmm. So you have self, other, and affect. Um, in the CAU system, you have cognition and affective units. That, that come together. An example of that in Michelle's theory is rejection sensitivity. Sure. So what happens in the brain when individuals, normal or personality disordered, are faced with a situation of rejection? Mm. That's a hot system phenomenon. Sure. And how does the individual handle that situation? But you think that you can have a genetic vulnerability to rejection uh, sensitivity? Mm. Because yesterday I read the paper, it seemed to assume that there was a, a genetic part or a temperamental part. Ah, I, 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 I would say the latter. I think there's a genetic predisposition to temperament. Mm. And then I think temperament probably gets woven into one's experiences of rejection and how one handles that. And what makes resilience? What makes what? Resilience. Resilience? Uh. Um, I, I can tell, if tell you me. have a family and uh -huh. you have a rejection and uh, there are two different uh, kind of uh, reactions. A person goes to a uh, sensitivity to being refused, and the other one becomes engineers and go away. Mm -hmm. And how would you explain this? This mm -hmm. concept? What is the resilience? Mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure I could explain it, but I think some of the elements involved, um, getting back to some of your earlier questions, would be the individual's ability to combine uh, affective responses with a certain amount of uh, effortful control. There's a lot of developmental literature now that children, uh, not necessarily pre-borderline, but children who have both effortful control and the ability to modulate their temperament are much better off than children who lack a certain amount of effortful control. Mm -hmm. The first group can play with other children. They can play cooperative with other children. They don't have hostility and they don't have aggression. And, interestingly enough, they develop moral values. Mm -hmm. 
They have an internalized moral system. Mm -hmm. The children without effortful control have more conflict with other children. They have more hostility, more displays of hostility, and they don't have as much an internalized sense of moral values. That's interesting. Yeah. And uh, John, I have a last question for you. Um, can you describe the difference between confrontation, it is your way you go on borderline patients confrontating behaviors or emotions, in your sense, and our the cognitive disputing, can you find analogies? Can you find differences? And, and the cognitive concept is disputing? See, si, disputing. Um, in other words, uh, the therapist disputes with the patient si. what the patient's saying? Si. Well, I, I don't know much about disputing, but um, We, we don't, we use the term confrontation, but we don't like the connotation. We don't like the connotation of aggressive uh, si. approach to others. What we really mean by that is looking at the patient's story, the patient's narrative, and seeing uh, inconsistencies in that narrative. And it's really a questioning. It's really saying to the patient, wait a minute, you're saying on the one hand that your girlfriend of five years left you, but on the other hand, it, she did it because of her therapist, not because she wanted to or that she desired that. Uh, how, do you, how do you understand that? And so it's really an exploration of inconsistencies in the patient's story. And we think patients have inconsistencies because there's a lack of integration and there's, there's uh, defensive maneuvers that, that compartmentalize some of what goes on in the patient's mind. See, uh, in co what I would say in conclusion uh, of these days that we are seeing and uh, with your hospitality the way you are working and uh, I, I find it very interesting the way that you make questions, uh, very analytical way of making questions. You mean with the patient? See, uh -huh. and uh, even with a student who tests the patients in supervision, mm -hmm. very analytical way. And the way you work uh, on the now of the session. And this is something that I think we, we can try to integrate in our therapy with difficult clients. Mm -hmm. So thank you, John. You're welcome.